Shane and Gina, they are a gift to this body. They are a gift to us. And we just ask the anointing of God to just flow through Shane and to minister to us in Jesus' name. Come on up here, buddy. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Sorry, there we go. Thanks. I didn't go all the way far. Thank you for saying that. All right. <laughs> now you can hear me pretty clearly now. So, um, Randy and Hannah, your family, as I was uh, worshiping this morning, God really just gave me a word for you guys. I really felt like restoration, um, the word restoration for you guys, and then also like um, recover all. I really feel like there's been a lot of things that have happened over the last few years for you guys, but God's wanting to restore all things to you guys. Just like David, when he went to Ziklag, he came back, everything was gone, and you felt like, like everything was destroyed. A lot of family stuff. God's wanting to restore everything, and he's redeeming it. So there's going to be some amazing things that God has in store for you guys. You guys believe that? Let's just extend our hand to them. Lord, we just thank you for this family, for Randy, Hannah, and all their families. God, we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give them hope. God, we restore hope to them to believe again, to trust again. And I pray that you would just help them to continue to be a blessing. I know that you have dreams on their um, hearts that haven't been revealed and they haven't been um, manifested yet. So I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would start to do a turnaround, redeem this situation in Jesus' name. Everyone says, Amen. 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 Keep us posted. God's going to do some cool things there. So this morning, I really wanted to talk about um, a message on my heart. It's time to stoke the fire. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like sometimes it's easy to get discouraged. You guys ever been susceptible to discouragement? Come on, you can raise your hand in church and like be honest in church. Is that okay? All right. Everyone should at least be honest on that one. I would think everybody would be honest that we actually get discouraged at times. Um, I remember when I was a kid, we had a, uh, a wood... Uh, a wood fireplace would actually um, stoke it as like a wood stove and that, that's the way we, we kept warm in the, in the winter times is we actually had to um, get everything in there, get kindling and get the fire started and everything. Uh, how many of you guys have ever built a fire before? Okay, it's not easy to build a fire and um, when the fire goes out it's, it's not fun, right? It sucks when the fire goes out and you're like, oh my gosh, now I got to start it all again, I got to get the paper, I got to get the kindling. It's always a challenge to keep that fire, get it restarted. But when you keep it going, it's a lot easier to keep it going, right? If you got those hot coals in there, um, before you go to bed, you always got to remember, hey, you know what? We got to make sure we put a big log on the fire. That thing goes out, we're going to be freezing at the end of the night. We don't want to be waking up in the middle of the morning at like 2 in the morning freezing cold because the fire went out. How often in our lives, though, spiritually... Do you guys feel like the fire's like, ooh, man, I don't feel that fire anymore. I don't feel that passion, that zeal like I had with Jesus when I first experienced and encountered his love. Am I the only one that's ever felt like I don't have that same zeal and passion at times? We have a responsibility to stoke that fire. And I'm the first one to admit, there's moments when I haven't been perfect about stoking the fire. And I can't blame Pastor Keith. I can't blame all the other spiritual mentors in my life. You haven't been feeding me. You haven't been giving me everything I need. I don't feel loved, Keith. How come you're not calling me every night and coddling me? We've got to grow up, right? Come on. Anyone feel like the church needs to grow up? All right, now I'm not trying to be insensitive, but I feel like a lot of times we blame everyone else and our situations in our lives for the reason why the fire has lost in our lives, that we aren't keeping that fire blazing hot. So I, I believe there's some fire starters in here. So how do we stoke that fire in our lives? I want to um, share that with you guys here. There's a, something powerful about spending time alone in God's presence. I can't force it on you. You can't force it on me. It's something that you've got to want and desire yourself. No one else can spend time with Jesus alone but you. And that's an amazing privilege, and that's not a condemnation. That's like, man, why wouldn't we want to spend more time with Jesus? You guys know what it's like when you're alone with Jesus and he shows up. You guys ever encountered him in such a way you're like, wow, you will never forget it. But why do we go and we continue to live this life in our own efforts? 
It's miserable when you try and do this stuff on your own. I don't know about you, but man, I can't do this life on my own. That's, that's, that's going back to being a practical atheist. 17 years ago, if you guys don't know my testimony, I was an atheist. And I don't want to go back there. It was a dark place. It was like living in hell every day. I felt like I didn't want to live every day. Life sucks and you die. It's a crap sandwich. That's the way I thought about life. And that's the way I thought about other people. You see through this lens of misery. There's a lot of Christians that are supposedly Christians that are supposed to have Christ modeled and they look like Christ every day. We slip into that. That's not what we're called to. Exodus 33, 11 says, And so the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face. Can you imagine that? Speaking to God face to face. We idolize people like Moses. Like, oh man, he was just face to face talking to God like a friend. We have a better covenant than Moses. You have him inside of you. You have the God of the universe shacked up inside of you. You don't have to wait to go to heaven someday. Heaven came inside of you. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, heaven lives inside of you. That's the good news. Man, when heaven's inside of you, it changes everything. So Moses met with him face to face. It says, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses returned to the camp, his attendant Joshua, son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Why was Moses so focused on being in the tent? Do you guys know much about some of the Old Testament and the scripture of the tent of meeting? What the significance was of the tent of meeting? What was in that tent that, Mo that Joshua was so fascinated by? It's God's presence. That's right, Beth. We let a lot of other things captivate us. What about the presence of God? You want to get on fire for God? Get alone with Him. Oh, I ain't got time, Shane. You don't know what my life's like, man. I'm working three jobs, got a family, got all these issues. He wouldn't depart from the tent. Joshua made one thing more important than anything else. He, no, Moses wasn't expecting him to be in the tent. Say, you don't leave that tent until God shows up. That's not what Moses was saying. Joshua willingly was in there, and he went beyond any requirements or expectations of other people on him. No preacher is going to be able to expect you to spend, oh, you, did you spend 30 times with, 30 minutes with the Lord this morning, Keith? If everyone's like checking in on Keith, do you think he's really going to want to do that all the time? It's something that he longs for himself. When is the last time we decided not to depart from the tent? That, that convicts me. When I get alone with God, it's like I want to be there longer. When I actually experience His presence and I know that His nearness and I, I know of His love and His goodness, I don't want to leave. Joshua didn't do this by accident. It was very intentional and he guarded his time with the Lord. It was a priority. We have a lot of other priorities. Like we think that our calling and our, our job and our friends and our entertainment and feeling good about life, those are all awesome things. But we think some of these other things are way more important than kindling that fire, stoking the fire. When did God, what did God require the Levites in the Old Testament? You guys know what, what he required of the Le Levitical priesthood? We were even talking in prayer this morning. Um, Joanne was talking about that we are called to be priests, Right? The royalty, we're all, now that we have Jesus, the high priest inside of us, we're called to this kind of calling like the Levites. In Leviticus 6.13, this is what the God commanded them in the Old Testament. The fire shall be burning continually on the altar. It shall not be allowed to go out. Translate that to a new covenant. And it's not like just, okay, like he's telling you this is what you have to do. He's saying this is who you are. You're never supposed to burn out. As a Christian that's fully connected with Holy Spirit, there is not anything called burnout if you do it in His strength and not your own. You will not burn out. If you completely rely on Jesus, there's no burnout. Why we see burnout is we rely on our own abilities and our own strength and we try and do it all in our own efforts. How many of you have been there? It's miserable, man. You want to take people out? That's why people are shooting things up right now. People are so on the edge of brink. You see all these suicides. You see all these people shooting things up. They are on the edge because they can't do this in their own strength. 
When we went out to those apartments yesterday, we brought life. The Lord gave me a fountain of life was the word that he gave us. We are supposed to be springing up life. Everywhere we go, people should feel like more alive when they're around us. Sometimes we allow that fire in the altar of our heart to go out. What did John the Baptist have to say about fire? You guys remember what he had to say about fire? He made it something way bigger than just himself. In Luke 3, 16, this is what John the Baptist said. But John made it clear by telling them, there's someone, there's one coming who is mightier than I. Let's just stop there for a second. A lot of Christians sometimes, especially in ministry, we make it about me. Make it about ourselves. There's somebody mightier than me. If, you, if I keep pointing you to my charisma, pointing you to my gifts and my abilities and all of what I can do and tickle yours with a great um, encouraging sermon, I'm doing you a disservice. But if I connect you to the King of Kings and you want to be with Jesus more than you want to hear about me preaching, then I've done my duty. So John had this revelation. He said, you know what? In fact, he is supreme. In fact, I'm not worthy to even be his slave. I can only baptize you in this river, but he'll baptize you into the spirit of holiness and into a raging fire. This is the translation in the, the Passion Translation. He wants you to get into a raging fire. Have you ever, ever seen a raging mountain fire? I, I've watched a video of that roaring lion fire that happened a few years ago. It ignited and it's like it looked like it was just kind of slow and then all of a sudden it took off. Wildfires consume. The fire of God can consume you if you have a heart ready to let him consume you. He wants to consume us. So in that word supreme there, in that, that little A thing up there on the scripture that you see on there, the word translated supreme is only found in the Aramaic text. John was a true prophet who pointed others to the supreme one. As followers of Christ, we, fought, we point them to the supreme one who is Jesus Christ. That's the good news of the gospel. It's not about all this self-help and how you can go through this program or that program and all this other things. It's always about pointing people back to Jesus. You get along with Jesus, he's going to change your life. B, if you look at the actual word slave there, to lose, like, see, John's comparing him, say, you know, like, I'm not even worthy to loose his sandal strap. Did you guys know in that time frame, the only person that could do that is a slave? We see ourselves low enough, not in a, like a self-hatred kind of way, but we see ourselves low enough to where, you know what, I don't have anything to offer outside of Jesus. But I also know that when I offer people Jesus, that I have, it's not like this, this false humility where I'm nothing, right? There's that danger on that other side of it. But there's this humility to wait. You know what? I, the best thing I can offer to anybody is not just my, my own abilities and how smart I am or how good I am with people. It's Jesus is the answer. So... And this last part, the raging fire, you know what? This is actually how the Aramaic text reads. It says, he'll baptize you into the spirit of the Holy One and in light. That fire is actually a same word as light. And you know what light means in the, in the scriptures? It means revelation. God's revealing something to you. When he come, you come into his presence, he shows something of his heart. We're not just talking about a feel-good fire that gives you the goosebumps. I love that kind of stuff. And I love being intoxicated in his presence and inebriated and feel like it's just out of this world, like I'm in ecstasy. I love that. But even more than that, I love his presence and his connection that he sees me as a son. That I feel so loved and accepted and approved. So what happens when we see this light? A baptism of light or fire would cleanse and change a life. It actually changes to where we can't be the same anymore. When we're in his presence, they said that you could never meet with God face to face. You know what that actually meant? You could never meet face to face with God and be the same afterward. He changes us when we show up and we're in his presence. We're never the same. You can't be with God and come out the same as you were before you met with him. Otherwise, you're not meeting with the same God that I know. Amen? Amen? That's good news. Like he, he's the only one that can change a heart. It's so good. Giving new power to live for God and deal with every issue that hinders love and passion from burning in our hearts is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that all believers, say all believers. All believers, all believers need it today. 
Some churches, and I'm not going to bash in other churches, they're still our brothers and sisters. They may not have a revelation, but they don't know the power of Holy Spirit. They know the power of Holy Bible, and they know the power of Jesus, and maybe sometimes they met, mention Father God. But there's something about Holy Spirit that comes and it wrecks you in a good way. Because all of a sudden, all the ways you used to live your life, you don't rely on those things anymore. You realize when, when I go to work and I feel consumed, I got problem after problem after problem coming at me, 100 employees coming at me with all these issues every day, I can easily get consumed by it. And sometimes I have those moments. But I have to realize I'm on assignment. God has placed me there, and I'm not saying that arrogantly. He's put me there on assignment, and I haven't finished it yet. So until he calls me somewhere else or on another assignment, I'm going to stay there. I'm going to, I'm going to ask God, what's he doing in the middle of this? Instead of putting the, pushing the ejection button when I feel a little pressure, so you're like, what's God doing right now? Maybe I need to spend a little bit more time with Jesus because right now I'm not acting like the real Shane. Some people think, well, I'm just being real. No, you're not. If you're not spending enough time with Jesus and you act out of your flesh, you're not acting like the real you. You were called to always be attached to the Father. That's why they were in the Garden of Eden. It was in His presence. Their identity was always attached to the Father. Our identity is not attached to us and me and all I want. I'm preaching to myself. Hopefully you guys get some of it too. What happened to Jesus' disciples when they're waiting for the promise? John talked about this fire. Jesus mentioned that, you know what, I'm going to have you guys go and wait. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I hear the word wait, you're like, oh man, I get impatient. I'm like, I don't want to hear the word wait. I don't want to wait anymore. He wasn't talking about the word wait that we think about. He's talking about going and fellowshipping with, that, with God. That word wait actually means to fellowship with God intimately. And as Christians, how often are we even waiting on the Lord? We're not just waiting for time to come and like, okay, I, I waited three weeks or I waited three minutes. No, we're spending time with him. We're enjoying his presence. We're basking in him. We don't even have to get alone sometimes. You can just be aware of his presence, whatever's going on. His presence doesn't leave you, right? The Bible says, I will never leave you or forsake you. It's awareness. Acts 2.3, it says, Then all at once a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. It separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. You ever feel engulfed by them? Sometimes in pre you know, when we're like worshiping and you just feel engulfed, sometimes you only feel like you can stand up. You're just like kneeling before him. So that's why some people are feeling led to do the flags. Some people are shouting. Sometimes people are raising their flags. Sometimes people are shaking. Those are different manifestations, how people are experiencing the presence of God. They're engulfed in this fire. <laughs> I had somebody on Facebook a few weeks ago I would post like posted this video of people getting ecstatically like laughter in the spirit and everything and I, I don't really care if you believe or don't believe in that that's that's not really the point but this one person was trying to convince me that in Acts this story that we're talking about when they were saying that they saw that them they they're like you guys are like drunkards they were seeing this there was a reason why they saw them as being drunk there was a behavior that they saw that made them think that they were drunk because they were out of this world. If our lives are so marked by Holy Spirit, we will look different than others. If we don't look different than others, there's something that maybe we need to do to change that. And the only thing that can do that is Holy Spirit. So if you look at the word eyes, this pillar of fire that appeared before their eyes, this pool is a pillar of fire that led Israel from bondage into their promised land. If you look at the stories of Israel being delivered by God from Egypt and they crossed over the Red Sea and they were going to go into their promised land, there was a pillar of fire that led them by night. It was the presence of God and there was a cloud during the day, right? The same pillar of fire manifested here in the scripture in Acts 2.3 to initiate a new beginning from dead religious structures. Say dead religious structures. God rid me of all the dead religious structures that I've taken on in my life. Maybe it's not even from a church. There's dead religious structures that I've taken on because I feel like it has to be done a certain way. I don't want dead religious structures to keep me caged and to be domesticated. There's a whole generation looking for a living God. 
Not a boring religious dead structure. How about we do church a little different? Jesus didn't do the miracles the same way once. You know, like he'd only do it this way and then he'd do it creatively different the next time. So we go away from these religious structures into the powerful life of the Spirit. There's something that when the Holy Spirit shows up, it brings life and it changes things. It changes me first so then others can be changed around me. If I'm not willing to submit myself first, how can I expect revival to come? We're waiting for this whole um, thing where God just show up on the scene and bring revival, change our city. It starts in me. It's not going to magically happen by us just all of a sudden God just, boom, revival, everything's changed. He could do that, but he's always chosen people. You look in the New Testament, it's always been about God's man, God's woman. He's choosing people. And there's a corporate thing he's doing in the body of Christ. If we're awake to it, we can be amazing. We can be in a, a, a part of this incredible revival that he wants to bring. Each believer received this overpowering flame of fire in this Acts 2 that we're talking about, signified by a shaft of light. See, this fire again, it brings light. It brings revelation. It brings the understanding and the awareness of how good Jesus is. It engulfed them. It was as though each one had received their own personal pillar of fire that would empower them and lead them throughout their life. This was the promise, right? The promise that Jesus gave them. The one like me, the helper, the comforter, Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't like anything more than Holy Spirit. He'll show up in the middle of my work day, and I'm just kind of in a funk. And he'll like speak to me through other people. Speak to me through situations in the day. It's as though each one of those received that personal pillar of fire. And then this was the promise that they were given. They would be, and it said that Jesus said it would be sent by the Father and never leave them. That's good news. I don't know about you, but you guys ever felt like abandoned before? I remember when I was a little kid going hunting with my dad and sometimes to save me a whole bunch of foot traffic, he'd go get the vehicle and I'd be waiting there. It seemed like it was for like half the day, but it was probably only 20 minutes. And I felt like abandoned. Holy Spirit never abandons you. Some of you need to hear that. Holy Spirit never leaves you. Today every believer is indwelt by the Spirit of Christ. Romans 8 and 9. This was the birthday of the church of Jesus Christ. If you actually look at that word engulfed, it said that it actually rested over them. Holy Spirit rests over us. Like people should see Holy Spirit on our lives. They should see the light of Jesus in our lives, right? Amen? You guys okay? I might seem a little intense. Hopefully you guys are okay with that. It's like sometimes I get fiery and passionate. It's not, not that I'm angry. I'm just passionate. And I, I think sometimes we need to be shaken out of our mediocrity. I went to church when I was... First time I went to church when I was um, an atheist... I had to be shaken out of this whole dead religiosity that I'd experienced. I'd, I'd experienced pl plenty of dead religion when I was little. It didn't do anything to change me. I heard all the Bible stories. It didn't do anything to change my heart. Holy Spirit shows up and he wrecks you. You got to let him in though. He's knocking. Holy S so how did Paul exhort Timothy to stoke the fire in his life? You guys know about what Paul was doing? Timothy was one of Paul's spiritual sons, if you don't know, in the Bible. And Timothy, he was kind of in over his head. I don't know about you guys, but like the church was busting at the seams, man. You talk about revival and people bringing in their issues. You know what? Churches should have a lot of people coming in with their stuff, right? There's lots of people coming to church and they had all kinds of stuff they were going on. Get ready, church. If we're not ready to deal with people's stuff and we're so focused on having this perfect, nice little church here, we're never going to see revival. It's messy. People got... All kinds of issues going on. That's why I think God is so much. He pulled me out, into, out of like full-time ministry into the marketplace because there's more church that happens inside of my workplace than most churches. And I'm not saying that arrogantly. I'm saying the church needs to be the church wherever we're at. You may not have a pulpit here, but you have a pulpit where you're at. 
when you're ministering to artists, Steve, you have a pulpit, you have a platform, you have an altar for God where people can experience his goodness and his presence. They'll never be the same. How many other people have that opportunity to minister to these creative geniuses? That's amazing. You're discipling them. You're discipling nations. There are people from other countries that have been impacted by your artistic works. People you don't even know about right now around the world have received a painting from you or were inspired to paint themselves because of what God put inside of you. Who else can do that? We all have a creative genius that Holy Spirit's put inside of us that can connect with nobody, somebody like no one else can. Randy, when you do a work and you do job with your construction work, no one else can do it the way that you can. When you have integrity and your word means something, that changes people because they see that that's a rare thing anymore. Who else can replace who you are in him? We need to value what he's done inside of us. Amen? So here's what Paul said to exhort Timothy. Timothy's stressed, man. You guys talk about being stressed out. Timothy had every reason to be totally stressed out. Here's what Paul said to him. 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 7. I'm writing to encourage you to fan into a flame and rekindle the fire of the spiritual gift God imparted to you when I laid my hands on you. Verse 7. For God will never give you the spirit of fear. <laughs> He'll never give you the spirit of fear. Did you get, oh man. But the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power, love, and self-control. So this word rekindle in here, it actually means to excite the gift or awake the gift. Did you guys know this gift is not your gift that you can do in your own effort? It's a spiritual gift. It's a gift from God. I think that's powerful for us to delineate. You've got to stir up the gift of the Holy Spirit inside of you. How do you do that? You've got to excite it. You've got to awaken it. You've got to be aware of His presence. You've got to be aware of Holy Spirit is living inside of you. Don't go about your business ignoring him. Not intentionally. Sometimes we just ignore him. We're not aware he's still there. He's there. He said, so Paul's saying, excite this gift. Awake it up. Kindle it. Kindle that fire. And what about the spirit of fear? He's talking about the fear of man. I still, on occasion, battle this thing of being afraid what other people think of me. God has not put that on you. Say, he's not put a spirit of fear on me. That's not who we're called to be. So it's a fear of man rather than the fear of God that we're consumed by. The fear of God prevents us from fearing other people. Do you realize that? When we're more concerned about what he thinks and what the Holy Spirit has on his heart for people around us, we get over ourselves because all of a sudden I realize, you know what, Shane, it's not about your fear of praying for somebody or being there to listen to them and get into their life. It's about what I want to do through you. And I get over myself. I get over my insecurities. I get over all that stuff because somebody else needs life. It's not even about what I feel at the moment. How many other people need to know the love of Christ and you were sent there? And you're so consumed about what they think of you and that you might be weird. Rather than Holy Spirit saying, I put you in here. No one else, this person's never going to step foot in the church. You are the church to them. And you know it. You know that they would never talk to another Christian because they've been burned by religion. But yet you shrink in fear because you don't know who your God is. God wants to convict us of that. How do we get over this? Stoke that fire, baby. Get alone with Jesus. Come on, it'll change you. You want to get wrecked? Get alone with him. It's the only thing that changes my ability to see myself differently in situations at work or with my friends or family. I believe that God wants to consume all of us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. For our God is a holy what? Devouring fire, a consuming fire, it says in some versions. What's that mean? It's the actual Americ, Aramaic that says can be translated consuming light. You know, when Paul was on the road and he got blinded by light, it was consuming. It's like he was blinded. What if you actually had the way spiritually to where all of a sudden, like, you caused people to, like, kind of go into a trance and just, like, stop for a minute? Whoa. What just happened there? What Randy just said to me there, that, those words were profound, and that, like, that, that just shook, shook me a little bit. We should be shaking people up. 
right? That's what I believe anyways. That's, I, I don't know about you guys, but there's, there's a, cool, a few cool quotes that I, I've been reading here lately that just kind of stir me up. I don't know about you guys, but I, I feel like sometimes I need to be stirred up. Do you guys? So John Wesley, he has this quote, when you set yourself on fire, people will come and watch you burn. You're waiting for other people to set you on fire. How about you set yourself on fire? Holy Spirit, consume me. Holy Spirit, have your way in me. Do what you want to do. What do you want to do today? What's on your heart? What are you seeing in this person? Treasure hunting that we do on Saturdays, third Saturday of every month, that should be a lifestyle. We should be seeing people as treasure, man. (laughs) Sometimes we don't see them as treasure. We see them as the biggest barrier in our life the biggest frustration the irritant like there's some people that just get on your nerves right come on but what's God want to do in their life he wants to change our perspective in the way he sees what we see in that situation so here's another story from William Seymour if you don't know who he is he's he was the kind of the big fire starter in the Azusa Street revival that happened back in April 9th 1906 to 1915. That's quite a while, about nine years that that fire started. And we still see the benefits today. Assembly of God Church and even Foursquare came from that original fire, the Azusa fire, the Azusa Street revival. So if, if you want to hear about somebody that maybe knows what they're talking about, this might be somebody to listen to. All right, so here's what William Seymour said. In a short time, God began to manifest his power, and soon the building could not contain the people. Oh, we're begging people to come to church. How come they don't come into our church? Maybe we're not kindling enough time with our Jesus alone in his presence, but just saying, here's what happened. Now the meetings continue all day and into the night. The fire is, rekindle- is kindling all over the city and surrounding towns. We're just thinking about, oh, if God would just bless our little community, if God would just bless Hamilton. No, it just starts spreading like wildfire. You can't contain it. When God starts showing up, people come from around the world to experience what God's doing. Proud, well-dressed preachers came in to investigate. Right? You guys ever seen the, the, the um, revival police show up on Facebook or anything else on a post? They're like, oh, I don't know if that's really the Lord. You've got to be careful. Test every spirit. All right, they're showing up, right? They came in here. Soon their high looks were replaced with wonder. Their, then conviction came, and very often you'd find them in a short time wallowing on the dirty floor, <laughs> asking God to forgive them and make them as little children. This wasn't in your nice little church. This was in a factory environment. William Seymour knew how to spend time with Jesus. There's this man named Alfred Gar that shut down his mega church because he went to one of the meetings that William Seymour was putting on there, and he helped finance the revival. Sent, shut down his whole church, brought all the resources and finances and his people to go to that revival. And this one thing that Alfred Gar said, his, his wife said, you know what, if you do this, if you shut down our church, I'm going to leave you. It's like, before you decide to do that, and that's your decision if you want to do that, just go to this one meeting with me. And if afterwards you still help, feel the same, you're welcome to do what you want to do. You know what ended up happening? She got hit by the power of God. And it started a worldwide ministry to where they went and did mission trips over in India and they helped finance all the revival of Azusa Street that we still benefit personally being in this church today. What if God would set you on fire to where it would change nations? We don't think it's possible. We have so much unbelief and disbelief in the church. There's people in the world that believe more than we do sometimes. The only way we can believe is when we've encountered him so much to where we can't unbelieve. No one can convince me out of my Jesus. I was dead. I was ready to take my car off the road. I I don't care anymore. How people persecute me. People wonder, how could somebody have their head chopped off for Jesus? How could somebody become a martyr? They're so convicted by, they've encountered the Jesus in such a real way, they would never leave. They would never denounce what they've experienced life because they knew what it was like before they met Jesus. We're coming into an era of persecution that Keith was talking about. And it's already here. It's already at the doorstep. And we think that we're going to withstand the level of persecution that's going to continue to amplify without being connected to the Spirit of God like that. 
We're sadly mistaken if we think that we're going to be able to withstand it without his help, right? In the Old Testament, fires always, fire, fire always fell on a sacrifice. And a lot of times it was a lamb. In Leviticus 9.24, it says, The fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering, the portions on, of fat on the altar. When the people saw it, they shouted and fell face downward in awe and worship. There's something that changes us to actually be worshipers. I don't have to cheerlead for you anymore. I don't have to try and get you to try and like express your praise and worship to God anymore. You're already there and you're celebrating with your brothers and sisters in here. You're doing it home. You're doing it on when you're driving in your car to work. You're doing it when you're getting up in your shower in the morning. You're already in a lifestyle of worship and prayer. You're aware of them all the time. And we come and we just stoke the fires more and more. There's sometimes I get around certain people. When I get around Keith or other people that are on fire for God, it, it amplifies my fire. I, I feel like I get more fiery, more shiny, like Keith likes to say it. Like I get to where like, you know what? I like being around people that are on fire. It makes me feel alive. Get around people like that. Now because Jesus became a burnt offering for us on the altar, you know what the ultimate altar was? It's the cross. The ultimate sacrifice of all time, forever and ever. Jesus took all of your stuff, all of my stuff, all of humanity's stuff, all of my sin, all of it, all of my filth, all of my arrogance, all of my pride, all of it, he took it all. And my arrogance, my pride to say I was an atheist and you're stupid and you're a religious thing, I'll flush it down the toilet. He took it all. Took it on the cross. He took it from me. You can't take that away from me. It's the ultimate altar. There's a continuous flame that burns eternally at Calvary on that cross. There's a, there's a fire that has never went out. Go back to the cross. Go back to the cross and remember what he did for you. Go back to the cross and remember how he died for you. Need that altar to rem remember the altar that he has continually burning in our hearts. Sometimes I think we forget about the power of the cross. We're afraid to talk about it. That somehow we talk about sin and convict somebody for crying out loud. Let's get convicted. Myself, I need to get convicted. We have a whole world that has never even heard about the cross. There's tons of people that have never even heard about the cross. Because we've got pastors and preachers that are afraid to preach the cross. We're afraid to even mention the word repent because we defend somebody and then walk out of our service. There's only one way to experience life. You've got to die. It says, the Bible says that you died with him on the cross. It's no longer I that live. It's Christ that lives inside of me. That's good news because you didn't want the, the shame that, <laughs> that it was an atheist 17 years ago. You don't want him in this place, I tell you. Miserable. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says this, to preach the message of the cross, it seems like sheer nonsense to those who are on their way to destruction. That's why we're afraid to preach it because it seems silly. It seems like crazy. Seems like it doesn't make any sense. But there's something when you live a convicted, fiery life that all of a sudden those words aren't just words anymore. It pierces hearts. When was the last time that our preaching pierced a heart, not only of people in a church, but of a community? In your lifestyle at work where people were convicted and they wanted to say, how can I be saved? I want that. That's what I want. I don't know about you. Here's what it also says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, But to us who are being saved, it is the mighty power of God released within us. It releases the power of God when we remember all the things we've been saved from. I've been saved from a life of misery, defeat, death. I don't want to go back there. I don't know about you, I don't want to go back there. There's people that need the love of Jesus in our lives. There's a testimony uh, just the other day here. Um, we had a young man that was doing work on our house, gave us a quote for doing some work. And um, there was a lot of miscommunication and things that my wife and I were irritated about. And, um, you know, all of a sudden we, 
we told them it's just not going to work out, left a message, never heard back, and um, Friday, just the work just got done. We're like, what? <laughs> we said, no, we don't want, it's not going to work out, we're going to use somebody else. Upset about it, and um, so my wife's telling me the story, I'm starting to get worked up a little bit, I was like, hold on a little bit, I was just like kind of trying to pay attention to what God wanted to do in the situation. Not easy when you, like somebody just shows up and does something, and you're like, you didn't feel good about the situation. So, like, practically, I'm like, okay, well, how am I going to deal with this? We got an invoice, you know, of, of some money to pay. And I'm like, we told them that we didn't want to have the job done. And so, long story short, we ended up having that person just come to our house. And I was like, you know what, we're going to pay it. We're going to just pay it. We're not going to argue about it. I'm just going to say, hey, you know, communication could have been better. You know what ended up happening? Ended up to a ministry opportunity. This young man has stuff going on in his family I would have never known about. Because if my pride would have got in the way because I feel like you don't deserve money and I'm going to tell all my friends and everyone else who would have got into a bloodbath and who knows, could have vandalized our house, could have hated everything else, could have destroyed his walk with Jesus. This, this young man is going to church. He's got a lot of stuff going on in his family. And I ended up having an opportunity to pray to this young man. And actually, he's like, man, I love prayer. He's like, hey, I want to pray for you. And he prayed for me. I ended up getting blessed by this man. If we are not on fire for Jesus, we miss those opportunities. Because we're so focused on, you know what? I was wronged. This person's trying to take advantage of me. Oh, yeah. I'll, oh, yeah. You know what? I'm going to Better Business Bureau. I'm going to shut you down, punk. You know what? I'm going to talk to everyone in Hamilton. I'm going to put on Facebook. You're going to be, I'm going to take you out. That was the flesh side of Shane saying, you know what? I'm going to take you out, boy. You're going to learn your lesson. It came out so much better, man. Like, I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. I'm like, I'm paying something I don't agree with. But like, you know what? It turned out so much better when Jesus shows up and he redeems a situation. I would have never done that. I would have never done it. When's the last time you did something you'd never do because Jesus spoke to your heart about it? There's moments every day. He's knocking on our hearts. He's saying, let me in. Jay, let me into this situation with this whole contract. You think, I know it's a mess. These people are being a really unreasonable to deal with. But let me enter this situation. I got a word of wisdom for you. He's very practical. We think it's just about church and feel goods on Sundays. When the rubber really meets the road is when we actually start living our life. And we can be Jesus in that situation. And we can notice that there's a ministry opportunity in the middle of it. There's people right now that are on the brink. What if you could be the one to actually be the reason why somebody doesn't commit suicide? How much better would you feel about that? What if you could actually be the one that ministers and helps bring healing to somebody that had a terminal disease? How practical is that to that person? What if you could actually bring life in a situation where they felt like their, their family, they would never be able to get back together again. They'd never be able to enjoy life again. And you bring a word of hope that helps them see that they can continue on past what they thought was impossible. We need to remember that Jesus deserves the reward of his suffering. We need to remember the cross. It says that he deserves the reward of his suffering. I think it'd do everyone good to watch The Passion of the Christ again. I don't even like watching that movie. It hurts me every time that I watch that movie. But it brings it so alive inside of me that my Jesus took those stripes. He took all my sin. He took the crown of thorns. He was ridiculed. He was destroyed on public display, mocked. He took it all. I think we need to have that revived inside of our lives. In Revelation 5, 11 through 14, this is a vision that John had of heaven. Then I looked, I heard the voices of myriads of angels in circles around the throne. Just picture that. Close your eyes for a second. Picture this. As well as the voices of living creatures and the elders, myriads and myriads. As I watched, all of them were singing with thunderous voices. This is what they said. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive great power and might, wealth and wisdom and honor and glory and praise. Then every living being joined the angelic choir. Just look at that. Just picture it. Huge. Like millions of angels, I believe. Or thousands upon thousands. I'm, I'm talking about tons of angels, right? Every creature in heaven and on earth, under the earth and in the sea, everything in them were worshiping with one voice. This is what they said. Praise, honor, glory, and dominion be to God enthroned and to Christ the Lamb forever and ever. 
Then the four living creatures responded, Amen. And then the 24 elders threw themselves face down on the ground and they worshiped. That's the encounter with the living God. That's somebody that's on fire. They're constantly in the fire of God. And we're going to be there for a long time. We might as well get prepared for it, right? Might as well start experiencing heaven on earth right now, right? Amen? Paul bragged about the cross, Galatians 6.14. May the only boast we be found in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In him I have been crucified to this natural realm. You've been crucified. All this natural realm, it's dead to you now. It doesn't have a, a chokehold on you anymore. It doesn't control you. And the natural realm is dead to me and no longer dominates my life. I love that translation. Things that you would normally respond to, it no longer is the one thing that rules you. Christ rules me. It's no longer I that live. It's free, man. Like all of a sudden, any persecution, bring it on, dude. Come on. Take me out as long as I bring thousands upon thousands with me to heaven. My life doesn't matter to me as much as I see other people's lives impacted by Jesus. That should be the story of every Christian. It says the disciples loved not their life even unto what? They didn't love their life even if it meant they would get killed. We're worried about someone being mean to us. That, that video we watched that Keith was talking about, Samaritans spitting on you. Somebody saying a mean word and looking at you and saying, oh, really? Come on, let's say you think that Jesus is cool or something. Ooh, you're real cool, Jesus freak. And we're like, oh, that hurt my feelings. I'm never going to talk about Jesus again. Come on. It's worth it. Who cares what they think of you? What if one would actually experience how good he is, though? What is the impact of one changed life? We were crucified with Christ and we're no longer slaves to this natural realm. Paul carried such a fire that it changed his identity. This is what I like. We're going to be getting into identity stuff with supernatural ways of royalty. Here's what Paul said in Galatians 2.20. My old identity has been co-crucified with Christ and no longer lives. The old stuff that used to define you, okay, for me, for example, my career, being an engineer, that stuff I no longer identify as, oh, I'm this engineer. I, I, I just so have to be an engineer that loves Jesus. But my, my focus is on loving Jesus. And I just so happen to be an engineer. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. Isn't that awesome? We're connected with him at the hip, man. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me, dispensing his life into mine. Let's go one more scripture, 2 Corinthians 2, 15 through 16. We have become the unmistakable aroma of the victory. Ha <laughs> ha! You give off an aroma of victory. People see how you can overcome when they look at you. But it's not always the same for other people, right? So here's what it says of the anointed one to God, a perfume of life to those being saved. Those that want Jesus and their hearts open, they feel like alive and they feel like, hey, you know what? This aroma of life is bringing life to me. But it's an odor of death to those who are perishing. Those that are closed off have a hard heart like I was 17 years ago. You make them remind themselves that they got to die. They're like, dude, I want nothing of that. Get away from me. You're convicting me right now, dude. I want to just go out and do what I want to do. All right? Verse 16, it says, the, the unbelievers smell a deadly stench that leads to death, but believers smell the life-giving aroma that leads to an abundant life. And who of us can rise to this challenge, Paul asks. In that actual word there for death, it says that is a sacrifice ready to be offered. Our lives are sacrificed ready and willing to be offered. They might, that might be physical. It might be your reputation. It might be all the things that you need to die to because somebody else might not be somebody like, maybe it's the person that wronged you on a contract bid. Going to rob you of money. And you're like, you know what? 
Maybe I need to lay down a sacrifice so that this young man can actually experience. You know what he did? He prayed for me. He's like, thank you that this man has a soft heart that isn't hardened. He ministered to me more than I ministered to him. Because he saw the Spirit of God working inside my life. He experienced Jesus through me rather than the flesh that would have destroyed it. I could have destroyed what God's doing in this young man's life. But I died, and I willingly gave a sacrifice because of what God put on my heart. That's what this is all about. As challenging as our ministry may be, when Paul asks that question, are we ready to rise to this challenge? God empowers us to overcome by his spirit and empowers everyone he calls. Amen? You don't have to do this in your own ability. That's the good news. I can't try and make stuff happen. I get alone with him. I get set on fire. I stoke that fire, right? Here's a few quotes, and we'll be done. Revival is God bending down to the dying embers of a fire that is just about to go out and breathing into it until it bursts again into flame. This is Welsh evangelist Christmas Evans. What a cool name. I like the word Christmas. Wouldn't you like somebody call you Christmas? This is the kind of Jesus that he carried. You know, he's like, you know what? Let's breathe on those embers. Holy Spirit, breathe on the embers. I know that there's still a fiery coal in there. Maybe you guys think that that coal is totally out, but if you still have Jesus, there's still a fiery coal inside that just needs the breath of God to bring it back into a flaming fire. Doesn't matter how long you have, have been ignoring him, there's still a fire inside of you. Here's the last quote. A blazing bush drew Moses, right? You know about the fire in the bush that wasn't consuming it. You think, oh man, that's a supernatural encounter. That's so awesome. We have something even better. You know what it is? It says this, a blazing church will attract the world. Not a religious dead church. It didn't say that, did it? It said a blazing church will attract the world. Maybe our churches aren't blazing. Is that why we aren't attracting the world maybe? I don't know. Just a thought. We want revival. But are we willing to pay the cost to spend time with Jesus? That's not self-effort. That's just intimacy and friendship with God. He said it cost us everything. He said it cost your whole life. But is it worth it? I think it is. How many people do you want to see in heaven? How many family members, friends, neighbors, people, en- enemies? <laughs> I'd love to see all my enemies in heaven. Wouldn't that be awesome? The people that you despise and all of a sudden God changed your heart and you see them up in heaven? You're like, God, that's redemptive. That's amazing. I hated that person. And you changed them because you allowed him to change you. That's a fiery church that does that. Leonard Ravenhill said that. So God desires to raise up a passionate remnant that will burn for his glory. <laughs> couple testimonies and we're almost done so testimonies i was in tijuana mexico in august of uh, 2013 and it was an amazing experience i remember this one time there's this teenage girl and i just felt for some reason it wasn't in my own mind that she had one leg that was shorter than the other and um so i i, I sat her down i was like hey put your feet together and sure enough it's like an inch and a half two inches short one was like out of whack so i i prayed for her and I felt like something shifted in the spirit. I didn't actually see anything change with the length of the one leg, but she walks down, just like right front of the platform. She's walking this way. She comes back. She's got tears streaming down her face. And I asked the interpreter, I was like, what happened? She's like, she didn't feel anything when you prayed for her, but when she started to walk, she felt the difference. She experienced Jesus that day. Her and her whole family just were on fire for Jesus after that. That was one of the things that happened. There's this other moment. We were in this mall and that said clearly in the mall that there's to be no gathering of groups in this mall. This was before COVID and stuff like that. But this is kind of a weird deal and we're kind of like, well, we're on a treasure hunt and we got all these clues. And one of the clues that I had was a neck brace. I'm like, that one's going to be a hard one to find, Jesus. I hope that we find somebody. So we're looking all day, probably a couple hours. Finally, at the very end, when we're about to be done, I see this lady in a neck brace. I'm like, no way. That's our girl right there. So we go, and we're starting to pray for her, you know. And we're like, Jesus wants to heal you. And nothing's happening, man. She's not feeling anything. And we're like, hey, you know, you could test it out if you want. She's kind of like, I don't know. The doctor said I shouldn't be doing anything. Then all of a sudden, I got revelation. God said, you know what? She was in a car accident. You need to speak alignment. 
all of a sudden, that was the key of Revelation. We, I spoke alignment. All of a sudden, it's like, Vrick! like she just jerked. And then all of a sudden, it was no convincing her arm. She just threw that neck thing down. And then all of a sudden, she goes down and she starts to tie her shoe. And she's like, realize, I, didn't, I couldn't tie my shoe before. And in the midst of this going on, we're, I'm working with interpreters because I don't speak Spanish very well. So I'm, I'm noticing like there's like a crowd forming of people. And then also and I realize there's like security guards and cops forming. There's like four or five cops like, like looking at us and like our interpre- another one of our interpreters talking to them. I'm like, I don't, well, I don't know what's going on there. It just doesn't look good. And uh, they, this one guy is like telling him, he's like, God's doing something. And the security's like, I don't care what God's doing. This is against the rules. But God finished the miracle before they could kick us out of it. They escorted us out of the mall. It was an amazing experience. This is about living a lifestyle of Christianity where we're on fire, where you're not afraid of fear, man. You're in another country where you don't feel comfortable. They, they could just throw you in the slammer. They don't really care, right? You don't know. I, I wasn't afraid of that at that moment. I was more concerned about this woman getting her miracle because I knew Jesus spoke to me about a neck brace, and this woman's in the, neck is going to get healed. When you have a singular focus on what Jesus is doing, you don't care about the consequences. I'm not saying just to go be, do stupid things to be stupid, but if God speaks to you and it seems stupid, you should do it. Okay? Now, if you get to go do stupid stuff and you get thrown in jail and you're just like, Shane just said to go ahead and be stupid. Now, that's not what I said. If God spoke to you about it, that's different. And sometimes you can be blocked in prison and God used Paul for how much of his ministry in prison, right? Anyway, I'm done. So there was over 500 salvations and hundreds healed on that trip that we went to Tijuana, Mexico. We had over five people preaching at different churches simultaneously when we were down there on the red light district. Red light district, you guys, if you don't know what that is, is bad sexual kind of stuff happening downtown, dark place. That was where most of the miracles happened is when the darkest place of Tijuana. What if we'd actually have a group of people that go minister to some of these illegal immigrants that are coming in through the border, all these children that don't know Jesus, all these people? What if there'd be enough ministries and powerful people instead of agreeing or disagreeing with the whole situation, doesn't matter, you see it as an opportunity to bring in a harvest? What if we had the wisdom of God instead of getting wrapped up in all the media culture and how I hate what's going on with all the media, we see it as an opportunity of having eyes for harvest. Amen? Amen. All right, well, we're going to close in prayer. Before I do that, um, I want to bless Jim and Linda. I really felt like we were supposed to bless you guys for your new marriage. That's just it. Um, you guys mind coming up here? Is that okay? I'm putting you guys on the spot. I just want to pray for you guys real quick. We want to honor what God's done. This is an awesome couple. These are passionate people. Come on, give them a hand. <clears throat> Appreciate you guys so much. Yeah. Yeah, Lord, we just thank you for Jim and Linda. We thank you for the passion that they carry. They are fiery ones, God. They are passionate people, and I thank you that they're passionate about Jesus. I pray that you continue to bless this amazing marriage that you brought together. What you bring together, no man can separate. So we just pray for a blessing on this marriage for every day of their life. You continue to increase in their life, more of an awareness of your presence, and you give them a supernatural love, not only for each other, but for others around them. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Love you guys. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. They are good people. These guys work so hard. We have such great people at my workplace. I'm really, I'm biased, but I think we have some of the best workers in the valley here. Amen. So let's, um, let's go ahead. Uh, what we're going to do is um, in a minute, we're going to play a video, but I just want to pray for you guys. So everyone just extend your hands. Holy Spirit. I pray that you would stir a fire inside of us. Your church needs to burn with a holy, passionate fire, God, that attracts the world once again. You're raising up a remnant bride, I believe that right now, to bring life and to set the world on fire. May our boast forever be in the message of the cross again, Lord. Remind us that we have already been, <laughs> you've already been co-crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I that lives, it's Christ that lives inside of me. Our new lives are lit by the faith of the Son of God who loves us so much that he gave himself for me. And there might be some in this room, maybe, maybe you already know Jesus, but there might be somebody in here. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and you haven't heard the message of the good news like this, you want to know for sure that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You want to be born again. You want to have your life totally changed over. Go from darkness to light. If 
that's you, this is your opportunity. I want you to raise up your hand proud and just wave it at me. Say, I want Jesus. I want this Jesus. I want him in my life. I want him to burn inside of me like he never has. I want to know that Jesus is with me every breath that I have. Lord, we just thank you right now for the salvations. Just pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus. Let's just say it all together. I thank you for dying for me. On the cross. I, forgive me of all my sins. Empower me to live a new life. Fill me with your fire, God. So I can be passionate for you. Holy Spirit, fill me. Change me from the inside out. Write my name. In the book of life, I surrender my life so that you can fill me with your life. <laughs> yes, Lord, I just give you all the praise and all the glory. You are now a son or a daughter of God. This is just the beginning of a relationship. Jesus wants to do a deep thing in you. Freely you've received, freely you give. You don't have to have ministry training to go share what Jesus has done inside of your life this morning. If that's you, you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to be able to give that same gift that somebody else has, right? Amen? Amen. That's the greatest miracle of all. So we're going to watch this video. I want people to come forward. Everyone, I want you guys to come to the altar. I was thinking about this. Um, I believe God's going to give you a baptism of fire. And I'm not going to lay hands on you. I believe that Holy Spirit's going to do something without me even having to lay a hand on you. He wants to rekindle the fire. And I want you to just picture yourself at the throne and just looking up to Jesus and seeing what he's doing inside of you. This is a song by Carrie Job. It's called Embers. And he's wanting to breathe on the embers and the coals inside of your heart. He's wanting to reignite a fire inside of you so that you can burn bright for him. So let's just all come forward.